So my work and, and my group and what we do over in, in our project team in the division is focused on designing, building, and running experiments and developing the analytical and computational tools that we need to better predict how and why things burn the way that they do. And so this talk will give a good overview of that. I'll try to not get hyper-technical with it, but just give a really big picture of how this works and give some applications that we're focused on now. And at its core, and hopefully you're seeing something here, just stop me if you're not, uh, at its core, we're interested in material flammability uh, as it's a, it's a big part of fire safety science, but we're using across the built environment more and more of these synthetic polymers and composite or engineered materials that are lightweight and they're cheap and they can allow us to do a lot of wonderful things, but they can sometimes have an increased flammability risk. And so uh, we need to better understand how and why they burn and respond to fire the way that they do. And we need to understand that in the context of a change in what the threats and hazards that they are uh, uh, seeing. So you may be familiar with this old video of old furniture, which is the new stuff that we have. Using these more uh, plastic-based materials, we can see larger fire growth rates or larger peak heat release rates. And so NIST has a project right now saying, with that new uh, furniture and these new materials, how can we make that safer? How can we do that by understanding the physics and chemistry controlling the process and not having to use chemical flame retardants? Um, we might have uh, CLT or cross laminated timber, new engineer materials that exist in the built environment and let us build these wonderful new structures, which architects love, but what's the fire risk associated with that? How does that change peak fire size or burning duration in our rooms when we line different walls or ceilings with those materials? So it's the materials within our buildings, what we're making our buildings out of, the entire structure if you're in developing countries to use recycled plastics to build these. If you're in hyper-developed countries that are running out of space in cities and you want these tiny homes, well, let's build a plastic home with plastic floors, ceilings, roofs, and insulation and windows. What's the threat that's associated with that? How can we better understand it? Uh, and it can also be the materials that we have outside of our buildings, the fences, the sheds, the decks that we have there. As we start seeing these materials exposed to new hazards, how can we better understand how and why they burn? So last night I looked up the ongoing map of large fire incidents in the states and we've got something like 80 total incidents, 50 of them have, that have some kind of incident management team, nine of which are particularly serious with a type 1 or type 2 incident management team, something like 300,000 uh, cumulative acres that are burning right now. So as the drought moves and more regions of the country or world are faced with hotter and drier conditions, we need to understand what this hazard is. And pre-COVID, um, this was the you know, key image that I would share from earlier in the year when the world's focus was on Australia and the wildfires burning there. This is the new hazard that we're dealing with. How do we harden these structures? How do we better understand the materials, the components, and the structures themselves and how they burn? And how do we protect them against that hazard? So I'll give an overview of what our group is doing, how our uh, approach is designed, and we'll look at a bunch of different case studies from products and materials inside of buildings to these structures themselves in the wildland urban interface. So at its core, um, we do have different fire safety standards and they provide some idea of material flammability resistance to fire, but they're often designed in the context of, well, here's my product or component or building material. Here's how I think it's going to be used and what my likely fire exposure is going to be. Let's expose it to that and then see what happens and give it some kind of qualitative rating. But most of these tests don't actually, you know, quantify a material property or the physical me mechanisms controlling how and why it's behaving or responding to fire. So you can get conflicting assessments between them. And because of that, there's a need to better understand how can we quantitatively predict material burning behavior, such as fire spread and fire growth by measurement of these material properties. So very broad overview of how things burn. Imagine that this blue bar is some sort of combustible solid. I will heat it up at its base. As the material begins to heat up, it can degrade and produce these flammable vapors. They'll go out to the gas phase, burn with the ambient oxidizer there, and release energy in all directions, some of which goes back into the material itself. So now I have further heating, more of the material is exposed to external heat. I'm producing more and more of this stuff that can burn. My fire grows, I put more energy in and we have a positive feedback loop between gas phase energy release and solid phase material degradation. And it's this burning rate that's our key predictive quantity. How much stuff is coming off of that material? 
how much of that is burning, and so how large is our fire going to be. On the solid phase, we'll refer to this as pyrolysis. So that's the degradation of our solid in response to heating. And in the gas phase, we look at that as combustion. Very, very simple uh, depiction of this whole process. There are clearly more things that we need to be concerned about. So how exactly we ignite it, how strong that ignition source, how long it's last, is the material age, what are the ambient conditions? All of these things can affect fire growth. But at its core, we want to develop a baseline model and then add complexity to that as needed. So currently, there is no model that exists that can quantitatively predict the rate of fire growth over the surface of a material due to flame spread. And so we want to develop that ability. We want to be able to predict the fire size of any arbitrary material exposed to any arbitrary conditions based on measurements of the material properties that define how that material itself burns. And so those materials coming back to our whole system, if we know the heating coming into this material, I then need to know something about the solid phase, how it degrades, how heat transfers to it to predict its response to that heating or to that flame. And so the properties I need to understand in the solid phase to predict this, this mass loss rate include what reactions are occurring in the solid and what are the rates or the kinetics associated with those reactions. Once I know that reaction mechanism, I wanna know the thermodynamics of those reactions. So how much energy do I need to add to my solid to heat it up to a certain temperature. And once I'm at that temperature, how much more energy do I need uh, the heat of the reaction to make that reaction take place? And then once that stuff comes out and those volatiles are created, how much energy is made when they actually burn? So those are all my reaction mechanism properties that I wanna measure. At a higher level, I want to look at heat and mass transfer through the solid. So in the condensed phase, what is that material's thermal conductivity? How does it interact with radiation from the environment around it? And what are these different mass transfer effects? Does it melt and flow and drip? If there's a carbon fiber reinforcement or if there's some sort of barrier layer on top there, how does that impact the flow of gaseous or liquid pyrolysis? So these are all the properties that I need to measure. When I get them, I can develop a full pyrolysis model and hopefully be able to predict the burning behavior of whatever that material is. To get those properties, um, simplest thing you'd wanna do is go straight to a handbook and look them up. There is an ongoing effort within uh, SFP, the Society of Fire Protection Engineers. They're updating the current version of the SFP handbook. By version six, we will hopefully have better understanding in the appendices of these properties, but they're not necessarily available for every material of interest. There's a lot of variability in there. And so the current approach right now is trying to, within your lab, measure them in some way. And there's two main approaches that we'll work with, both of which involve inverse analysis of experiments. So a common approach is, is the global approach in which you take your material, whatever it may be, you run a single type of test at the bench scale, let's say cone calorimetry, and you can run you know, a couple of different heat fluxes, you measure the burning behavior of that material and use an optimization solver to calibrate all of those different properties at once based on the burning rate of that material. An alternative approach, which we've been using at the University of Maryland for about a decade, and which we're, we're developing further over at NIST, is a hierarchical approach where we have a bunch of different experiments across a range of length scales. We independently measure each of those properties and calibrate it through it in its own experiment. And then we have separate tests at higher length scales to validate, does our model work? Can we, can we predict burning behavior across these different scales? So again, at its core, we have some milligram scale tests to understand what are the reactions, that are occurring. We need to develop analytical tools that can take that measurement data and turn them into meaningful properties. So the reaction rates, the kinetics and thermodynamics associated with it. And then we'll conduct a series of bench scale tests to get those heat and mass transfer properties. Again, using some kind of inverse modeling and analytical tools that can extract those properties from that measurement data. Once that's all together, we have a fully defined pyrolysis model. We can feed that into our computational solver to predict burning rates or to predict fire growth rates in some larger scenario, which means we then need full-scale tests to validate that our model is working. And when this whole ecosystem is complete, the experimental data, the analytical tools to pull out the properties we need from that data, the computational models to predict fire behavior based on those properties, that's what we wanna share with industry, with fire protection engineers, with different researchers, if you're a material company, so that you can say, hey, I have this product, if I tweak this or that property, what's going to happen? How can I make it better or safer? Um, that's our whole picture. I wanna take a little bit of a step back and point out, depending on your application, you might need additional layers to this process. 
If you're doing just product research and you want to change this or that property, you can go down to submillimeter uh, length scale resolutions in your simulations. If you're doing, you know, 100 kilometer simulations of flame spread, you may have different models that you need to, uh, you know, develop a way to make this work into that. Um, different layers of it, but at its core, what we're focusing on is experiments across a range of length scales, model calibration there, and completely separate tests to validate that everything is working. And that approach is then conduct as few tests as possible, isolate each parameter of interest through each test, and then validate it that it works uh, to predict burning behavior in a bunch of different experiments. And so from here, I'll do a very quick overview of what those tests are, milligram bench and full scale, and then I'll just do a bunch of applications. We'll see how this can be applied to a bunch of different problems in fire safety science. And I will start with milligram scale tests. So here we're looking at a simultaneous thermal analyzer, which lets us conduct thermogravimetric analysis or TGA and differential scanning calorimetry or DSC at the same time. And so in both of these tests, you take a very small sample of your material, maybe five milligrams, you heat it in well-known conditions at fairly low heating rates in a well-known environment. And for TGA, you'll measure sample mass as it's heated. DSC, you measure heat flow to the sample as it's heated. And with these small sample masses and these low heating rates, what we're able to do is effectively isolate the reactions that are occurring from heat and mass transport processes to the material. So we can understand what reactions are occurring, what are the kinetics of these reactions, what are the thermodynamics of those reactions. When we have this data, we then use that decomposition model with a new experiment Microscale Combustion Calorimetry, or MCC. Here it's a very similar setup. Again, small material, low heating rates, but now all the stuff that's coming off, those gaseous volatiles, we burn them to completion. We measure oxygen consumption calor, we measure heat release rate by oxygen consumption calorimetry. And now I can define the heats of combustion, how much energy comes off of that stuff when it actually burns. With that, I have an idea of all the reactions that are occurring. I can use that data with a new experiment at a higher scale to understand heat and mass transfer properties. So I'll use something called the gasification apparatus where we create very well controlled experimental conditions. We have 1D heating with some sort of heating element above it. We control the atmosphere around our sample and we're able to measure sample mass loss rate, temperatures at the top or bottom surface of the material and how the material swells or collapses as it's burning. And for this, using that data, we can calibrate our models to determine thermal conductivity, absorptivity, and basically how it interacts uh, with heat transfer through there. And at the end, we have a separate set of measurements that we can take all of those material properties, put them together, predict burning rate, and we have burning rate measurements as separate validation. So milligram scale tests give us the reactions that are occurring, bench scale tests give us our heat and mass transfer properties, and then with all of that together, we want to move to larger scale tests to say, can we predict burning behavior at, at this scale or much larger? So this is about a half meter tall flame spread apparatus that we're building in my lab upstairs. We can look at uh, different aspect ratios of samples, different burning orientations. We'll measure mass loss rate, flame heat fluxes, temperatures, heat release rates, all the things you might want to be able to predict correctly about your fire and how it grows we'll measure here and then see if our model is able to predict that. And that gives us great model validation. And it also gives us a chance just to qualitative look at what's the behavior of this material as it burns. Is there some other complicating factor that we're not seeing that we need to then include in our model? And then moving all the way up to the full scale, this is not my lab directly, but down on the other side of campus, I get to work with some really great engineers and researchers and technicians who keep the large fire lab going. We can burn, we can burn two story structures but for this project that we're working on, we have simple two and a half meter tall panels or about eight feet tall if you're in the States or in Belize. Uh, we burn our material, we'll measure heat release rates, flame heat feedback to the surface of that material, CO, CO2, soot production, all great validation targets to say, did the model that we created at smaller scales actually work for real fire behavior? So again, big overview. We conduct as few tests as possible, isolate parameters to retouch, through each test and then validate across a range of scales. TGA data will give us the reactions and the kinetics of those reactions. DSC data gives us understanding of the thermodynamics of those reactions. MCC can help us understand the heat of combustion or how much energy is released when stuff burns. We have analysis tools to extract all these properties. Bench scale test gives us our heat and mass transfer parameters. And then finally, a series of full scale tests to see do our models quantitatively predict fire growth correctly. That's our whole big picture. 
And so we can demonstrate some validation of this work. Maybe five, six years ago, uh, you know, we first showed that we can predict temperature rise and, and burning rate of simple materials like PMMA. The group over at the University of Maryland led by Dr. Stolyarov, they've gone to extend this to a dozen different non-charring and charring polymers to composite materials, to materials with solid phase active flame retardants. We can predict that burning behavior fairly well uh, in response to known heating. We extended that to small scale, maybe 15, 20 centimeter flame spread over the surface of simple materials uh, with a collaboration with the ATF for fire reconstruction purposes. We showed, hey, you can use this whole process that we just worked through to choose the right version of MDF if you're going to re reconstruct your scene. So you have one that should be behave fairly similarly to what the actual fire behavior was in the, in the situation that you're simulating. Uh, we've done a couple tests in those full parallel panel setups uh, and demonstrated that we can predict heat release rate fairly well. It's still an ongoing process. And so uh, from here on, I'm gonna give a few last case studies or applications where we use this whole process in some way to address a different problem in fire safety science. On my end, I am super lucky to work where I am. I've got a pair of labs to my name, um, a whole bunch of different apparatus from milligram scale to full scale tests that we're working with. And we use that uh, to address whatever problem is coming our way. And one that we've had for the last two years or so is a collaboration with the USNRC. And they came to us asking for a way to better improve their probability risk assessments for electrical panel fires. So these are the biggest, one of the biggest sources of fire risk in nuclear power plants. The way that they currently approach the problem is fairly conservative. Can we use science to better predict those fire growth rates to understand what the fuel load is in those cabinets and give better guidance to fire protection engineers as they do their risk assessments? So we ran through all the tests that you saw there with the help of a summer student last year who's now finishing up his master's at the University of Maryland. We ran 14 full scale experiments on five different materials. We took flame heat flux and heat release rate measurements, which I can't quite show here because it's not through review, but We've got a wealth of data that we've worked with in the next year or so. Um, it was hopefully this summer before COVID, we we're gonna look at another different materials, carefully go through this whole process, uh, and then see how well we're predicting these behaviors with the fire dynamics simulator. Um, we've got a report coming out on that, on the statistics of these fires. Um, separate project. Uh, to keep all of this together, we've got all of this experimental data, we've got the parameters we're pulling out of there, the analytical tools that we can use there. Historically, different labs across the world have done some of these tests and saved some of this data, but then it gets lost or redone or we need to find it a different way. So with the colleague who's now at the Virginia Military Institute, we are working on building a database to store all of our experimental data, to store the analytical tools that you can use to analyze that and all the properties that come out of that. We're focused on small scale measurements for now. We're being really careful with the formatting and the metadata so that we can find this and not lose this in the end. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy with this project. It keeps everything together. And the hope is we can then share this with different users as FPEs or material designers or different labs. So when they're looking for this data to predict whatever they need to predict in their models, we have it available for them. Um, on the other side of this database, I have a colleague across campus, Matt Bundy, who is working on, uh, he leads the large fire lab there and he has a database that he's developed internally and that's just about to go live. So if you are my student in closure fire modeling, you will be using this database in fall. Um, but this links all of the large fire data that they've taken over the last years. You can choose any given project that's there, let's say transient combustibles, that'll open up a new project page with all of the different tests. So a quick view of how large that fire got, what's the peak heat release rate, how is it ignited. I can choose a given test, I can get some more information, have all the details and species yield, who ran the test, how it was done, when it was done, what were the test settings. I can click and, and get a video with a time lapse and a heat release overlay. I can go to the actual data that was collected there and download that if I need to. Um, this is all part of the process that we're trying to make it easier to get the data that we've collected, present it in an easy way, and have it available for researchers, engineers, students, whatever's out there. Um, and an even larger scale, uh, I'm working with a, a global group called the Measurement and Computation of Fire Phenomenon uh, Working Group. 
So this is a group of experimentalists and modelers around the world trying to make systematic progress in fire modeling. There's a gas phase combustion group. There's a solid phase pyrolysis group that I am part of. We're trying to understand what are all the approaches to develop these models. I've just showed you ours. What else exists there in the field? What's the best way? What's the most efficient for whatever our problem is? What constitutes good data? How can we share it and store it? And how do we de develop a form that we can all work together on this? Um, right now, I've spent the last month or so working through about 200 different sets of data from 16 different institutions in 10 different countries. We prepped that into a report. It's like 50 pages right now that the com committee is trying to narrow down to share all of this data so we come together and work with it and make real progress in fire modeling. Um, I think I have one last thing. I'm gonna wrap it up from here on some wildfire stuff. So if we're looking at, we're gonna bring it all the way back to the start of the, the lecture here. If we look at how wildfires spread, there's very coarsely two different ways that can happen. Um, from radiative exposure and direct flame contract, this tree is burning, so this one's burning and this one catches next. Or from firebrands, my tree is burning, my structure is burning, and these small little glowing embers can be lofted and start spot fires farther downstream. Um, for this first one, let's focus on flame spread through these trees. Um, we use the whole approach that we just presented in, in the last 20 minutes or so. And uh, through collaboration with the USDA out in, let's say, Montana and California, we get samples of different vegetative fuels that are burning in these wildfires in the, in the Western states. We perform the experiments we just talked about on stems and leaves of these different fuels. We develop decomposition mechan uh, reaction mechanisms for them whole bunch of data. We can say how this leaf or that stem burns, you know, degrades differently. We couple that with our MCC data to get heat release rate, understanding of heat release. Um, whole bunch of math, I'm not gonna go into that too strong. But at its core, I now have reaction mechanisms for a bunch of different fuels. And we can then see, does this affect model predictions of flame spread uh, in wildland scenarios? So with a colleague over at NIST, Kevin McGratton, who helps lead FDS development, we use these different fuel decomposition models to look at representative flame spread in this wildfire scenario. We demonstrated like a factor of two difference in flame spread rate based on difference in these fuel uh, decomposition mechanisms. We showed a strong influence on whether it was a stem or a leaf, whether or not we use individual heats of combustion for each of those reactions or just one global value. So we're making some really, prog really strong progress to understand how does the behavior of our fuel affect actual flame spread rate in these different scenarios? And hopefully we can extend this to a range of different fuels, to live versus dead ones, and to better model development. Um, on the other side of things, so that was flame spread item to item, we can also look at firebrands, which are responsible for roughly half of ignitions uh, in communities close to wildfires. And we can either look at Firebrand generation, so my tree is burning, how many firebrands are created, how they're lofted downstream, or what happens when they actually land on something that can burn. So we'll start with generation because this is something that I was able to do with collaboration at the University of Maryland back in January. We ran uh, a series of different tests on full scale trees. If you wanna do physics-based modeling of wildfire behavior and include firebrands, then the source term is how many firebrands are you making when your tree is burning? And so we've burned a series of two meter trees, a bunch of different species, different moisture contents. We allow them to burn. You can start seeing fire brands being lofted and collected off. We capture all of those brands and I can measure the total yield, how many fire brands are created uh, per gram of tree that actually burns. I've got a summer student helping now with that analysis. Um, again, data is fuzzy just because it hasn't gone through official review, but we have the first measurements of this yield for a bunch of different tree species at a range of moisture contents. I'm really happy with where this work is going. Um, and then one last thing we'll come to, looking at the other side of the problem, once this firebrands land onto a, a product or a combustible solid like your deck or mulch or the side of your house or your roof, what happens then? We're gonna get a really busy slide right here showing the whole work through that we're going through. Don't worry too much, this is a quick overview. The key idea is through a collaborative effort with NIST, with University of Maryland, with a colleague over at UC Berkeley, we're working on, can we predict the response of a solid? Uh, will it smolder? Will it ignite in response to these firebrands? And we have two parallel tracks. We want to understand the firebrands better. We want to understand the solid itself better. So for the firebrands, what's its burning rate? How much energy is it putting into our solid? For uh, 
the solid, the whole process that we just talked about for the last 20 minutes? Can we develop a model for how it burns? Can we validate that at the bench scale? Can we predict full scale fire growth? We're going to go through that for materials you commonly find in the wild and urban interface. We couple that all together. So we have our ember, we have our solid model, we put that together. Can we predict ignition of substrates? That gets us to the end. So we're about 25 minutes in. I can go through any of this in more detail, but I just wanted to give a large big picture of things. Um, I'll take questions from here. I think I'm fairly on time, I hope. And uh, I'll stop talking for a moment. Yes, Isaac, thank you very much um, for that presentation. So yeah, let's take some questions for the, from the audience now. Do we have any? I just talk too much. No one wants to say anything. <laughs> yes, yes. Don't be shy. Um, like I said, for those of you that tuned in late to the presentation, um, feel free to use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen, um, or feel free to raise your hand if you wish to voice your question. Sorry, I realized I was on mute. Um, so yes, we have, we have a few coming in from the, uh, the Q&A. The first one is from Olavita. Um, the question is, have you found that the computer modeling of a fire is accurate when you then conduct a physical experiment? Oof. Um, this is a heavy question. It's a very good one. Um, so it depends what exactly you're trying to model and I guess your level of, of accuracy there. So the, the best bar of accuracy is, can it reproduce my experimental measurements with the same uncertainty? So that's like a benchmark of how good you can be. In terms of what we can predict really well in fire modeling, if we're looking at uh, smoke and heat transport through buildings, we, we are very good at that right now. If we're uh, looking at just the material response of a solid in response to known heating, we're doing pretty well there also. So if I know heat transfer into the solid, uh, we've shown pretty, we, you know, within the uncertainty of our measurements, we can reproduce that burning behavior. When we move on to something like, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong screen. When we move on to uh, actually predicting flame spread across the surface of the material, that is wonderfully complex because now it's a solid phase problem, a gas phase problem, and coupling them in a way that works. So we're moving towards that pro uh, process um, there are some key steps that we want to make there. Hopefully the McAfee working group will get us there. I'd say we're not at the point right now when I would say we can accurately predict the rate of fire growth over the surface of a burning solid um, just in the properties that we have there. But we're making a systematic progress towards that. And some of the core things on just solid phase burning or, or gas phase heat transfer, we're getting key parts that you need to get right. We're getting those correct individually. So now the next step is coming together as, as our, our, ours our field and, and really making that work together. I'd say near term, hopefully. It's a long rambling answer, but hopefully that counts. Wonderful, thank you, Isaac. The next question that's come in is from William. Um, the question is, is the wildfire burning characteristic data available to the public? Uh, everything that I shared there is. So, we, we put that in, in a conference paper that went out last year, I think. So all of that's available. It's just one data set of, of many that are out there. Um, I'd say everything that I shared is available. If you want more details, feel free to shoot me an email and I can say exactly what there is. And I'm working on that project now with a colleague to add some more to it, couple it with generalized models that exist in literature. And then we'll, we'll hopefully publish that by the end of the year. All right, great. The next question comes from Alex. Um, the question is, in general, how many samples do you have to go through to get a decent set of data for the material properties? That is a good question. I can share by our approach what it takes and also note 
it's not the only approach that exists out there. And one of the big efforts that we're working on through Mac at P is, is trying to answer that exact question. How much data do I really need to have to understand everything about this material? So if I, I, I don't know your background, if you're already running these tests and you're familiar with things, if you are running, uh, let's say a bench scale test like cone or gasification, you probably want you know, a minimum of three tests that you're doing there. If you're going up to DSC measurements, those are much trickier and we're going to be doing close to you know, seven to 10 of those tests, making sure that we have everything right. So it depends on the test that you're doing. It depends on your approach for what parameters you're trying to develop and how you're getting them. Um, a key goal, and this is a strong driver uh, with, with the modeling group over at NIST, is to make that process instead of a series of days and weeks, but something that we can do in hours. And part of that is both the tests that we need to run and the analytical tools that we have to extract the data we want from this test. So again, not a straightforward answer. I hope that's okay, but it, it depends on the experiment that you're doing um, and how exactly you're approaching things. Um, I hope that's fair. All right, wonderful. We have had one question come in through the chat function. Um, this uh -huh. is from Chi. The question is, can you discuss the impacts of different fuel arrangement, compartment geometries, et cetera, on the total HRR after scaling up from bench scale tests? Sure. Um, so is the question, can we quantitatively predict that right now or if there is an impact? Um, and Chi, respond real quick if you got there. I'll keep rambling on you know, to the best of my ability based on that. Um, from from our approach of what, what we kind of shared in this presentation, the hope is if we're doing things correctly, then the properties that we've measured in the solid phase are true properties of the material. So the same as if you were a mechanical engineer and you wanted you had some beam and you wanted to know when it's going to deflect, you would run a test to get the modulus of elasticity and you would get a yield strength and say, I know the properties of my material. Now, how is it going to behave in this scenario? then you need to know like a shape factor and the loading on there. And so the fire equivalent is we run all these tests, we get these true properties of the material. And then in this or that scenario, um, it's a gas phase problem. How does heat transfer change? How does the plume shape change? How does flame attachment change? And it's a couple problem, not just the material properties. So can we quantify the room geometries and materials in addition to those fuels? Um, Yes, I would say uh, we cannot treat the product in the vacuum. If you have something burning out in the open, it will behave in one way versus if it's an enclosure and there's a hot smoke layer or if there's a product nearby it and those are either just radiating from one to the other or if they combine just to uh, form a larger flame. Um, that ideally when you're looking at room geometries and, and different configurations, that's not a material property behavior. That's a, a whole room fire uh, type problem. So this approach hopefully gets those properties right regardless of the scenario. And then it's other parts of the physics in the gas phase that you would want for you know, getting the impact of geometry or, or room configuration correct. Um, way, you know, maybe 10 slides ago when we looked at the, the, the database that we have here, how does room geometry or different fuels set up uh, very. We just completed a project with the NRC of burning transient combustibles. And it, it addresses your question hopefully fairly well. If I have one box burning by itself, what's the fire behavior or heat release rate if I have two boxes or if I have four boxes or if I'm stacking eight on top of one another? That will be, that is publicly available by, by certain reports, the, the large scale fire database that we showed for a little bit there, that's going to make it really user friendly to see how uh, how that varied for these different fuel sources. Um, hopefully that works. Again, a long answer, but I'm, I'm trying to get everything out there that I can. Thank you, Isaac. A few more questions have come in through the Q&A function. Um, okay. We have another one from Mohammed. Um, the question is, it seems that the number sizes, et cetera, um, sorry to backtrack, um, about firebrand generation. Uh, the question is, it seems that the number sizes, et cetera, are still limited to collecting statistics from experimental observations. Is there a plan at NIST to involve computational modeling to predict fragmentation of solid fuels or vegetation into firebrands besides experimental work? Mm. 
It's a good question. I don't want to speak for all of NIST to say that uh, is or is not happening. Um, I do work with Randy and Kevin fairly closely on the modeling side of these things. And one of the things that comes up often in those discussions is, do we have the resolution to include that model? Right? So if I'm doing flame spread over acres and acres, and I've got, if I'm lucky, a hundred meter length scale of my grid cell, can I practically have a computational model that will predict, well, my branch or twig got this thin and it charred this much, so it's going to break under this wind. And practically, the answer is no. So if you're trying to do that large scale type modeling, the most reasonable mm, approximation of what that firebrand generation is going to be is to get a firebrand yield. I have this size tree, it's 100 kilograms, it burns under this wind. How many grams of firebrands come off of there? It's a similar approach to you know, we're not including necessarily all the reactions occurring in a flame to get true soot production. We just say the soot yield is this or that when we're doing a, a typical room fire scenario. So um, I don't want to say it can't be done. I think I'm pretty sure Dr. Golner did a little bit of that work a year or two ago, uh, mostly through experimental tests and, and creating some scaling laws for it. But I am unaware right now of developing models to predict that from first principles versus feeding it in as a firebrand yield type uh, source term. All right, thank you, Isaac. The next question comes from Jacques. Uh, the question is, with milligram scale testing on the order of five milligrams, how do you ensure that the sample is homogeneous slash representative of a larger sample like an entire, uh, entire decking board? Uh, thank you, Jacques. We could have asked offline, now you put me on the spot. Um, I, I say brute force. Um, so if you are concerned about the homogeneity of your sample, testing in a couple places, if you're not seeing a big difference, then you're at the scale that you're testing and for the test that you're doing, you're getting fairly representative data for that whole panel. Um, just looking at a material, unless, you know, there's clear differences at the macro level, um, I don't know you could say with certainty whether it's, it's truly homog homogenous or not. Um, but with TGA that you're doing there, those are quick enough that you can spot check at a couple places where you'd expect to see differences. And if they do or don't appear, then, then you should be able to find that out within a couple of days of testing. The next question uh, comes from Octavian. The question is, I have seen a presentation at Interflame 2019 where FDS was used to predict the flame spread on Glenfell Tower. Having in mind the complex behavior of composite materials, how accurate do you think this modeling is and how can it be applied to real fire scenarios? Oof. Good question. And it's something that we're really always thinking of, at least at NIST, where we're developing FDS uh, and how it's, oh, the question disappeared. Um, so how can we be sure how accurate it's going to be and, and can it capture everything at Grenfell? Um, I don't want to call out any one modeler and say this test was good or bad right now. Um, I, I don't know that exact study, so I don't know how carefully they set it up. It might have been the most beautiful talk in the world, so I don't want to do anything specific, but I'll make some broader comments. Um, FDS is powerful as a fire modeling tool. Uh, for many reasons, one of which is the large validation data set that we have. So if you're using FDS to simulate, let's say, the, the burning of that cladding material in Grunfeld Tower, one of the ways that you can check is this simulation accurate is going to the validation guide and saying, are there any validation tests that demonstrate FDS can do this kind of flame spread or this kind of channel flow or this foam material, whatever it is, and those model predictions versus experimental realities um, will we'll show that. That's, that's part of uh, FDS development, uh, having a good validation guide and showing it there. I am unfamiliar right now with tests that would specifically capture what I might want to simulate for the Grenfell Tower, but I don't know that study specifically for what exactly it was that they were simulating. So I'll be cautious in saying it was accurate or not, um, I'd say it's, it's an open question of how well we can simulate flame spread over the surface of material, 
but FDS is absolutely great at smoke and heat transport in buildings and, and large rooms in general. Um, for a little more detail, I'd go straight to the validation guide and see how close different scenarios there match the specific one that they had in the 2019 paper that you referenced. Wonderful, thank you, Isaac. Um, another question has come in from Dr. Trouvé. Uh, the question mm. is, you mentioned complex flammable objects like electrical cabinets and, and nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the burning of these objects using the same techniques that you use for materials like PMMA? Right. So I think the question relates to um, not some, not just the material issue, but uh, inside, if you open up a cabinet, it's not just a flat wall. You've got wires sticking all over. You have different geometries. You have different packing densities and all of that. Um, when we first started this for the NRC, the, the original ask was actually not, can we do parallel panel tests or understand the fuel load? It was, hey, we have these cabinets. Um, we're not always sure what's in them because it's not easy to get access to open them. We don't know what the loading is. We don't necessarily know the ignition source. Um, we want you to predict the heat release rate and how that varies over time for any random scenario that's there, which had a lot of big open questions. And uh, you know, how it's igniting, what's actually inside there, can we do flame spread in a simple scenario? So as a first starting point, we had two parallel efforts. One was just understanding the ignition sources and we've got a report that we'll put out there soon. And the other is, let's make the simplest scenario of a electrical cabinet we can have. It's some enclosed, fairly small space. Let's have this wall and that wall, both made of the same combustible solid. Let's see if we can predict that simple configuration. So for the test that we have um, in our parallel panel test, yes, we did PMMA, but we also have the same circuit boards, GPO3 and GPO1, that you might find in these cabinets. And we chose similar materials that would be the wire jacking material. So on the material side, we're hopefully as close as possible there. We'll see how well we can do with that simple configuration of parallel panels. And if we demonstrate uh, accuracy there, then we can move on to how does packing density affect things? How does maybe orientation or ventilation affect that? Um, I'd say right now, um, I wouldn't expect that we can capture all of those complexities of everything that's happening in the cabinet just yet. but different parts of it, um, let's say fuel loading or burning in simple configurations or ventilation limited behavior, uh, if there's only this much airflow into the cabinet, those parts of the problem, I'd say we're doing all right. Wonderful, thank you, Isaac. Um, the next question comes from Jack. The question is, how do you ensure the reliability of large scale tests? Do you often have good repeatability and what are the, some of the main factors affecting reliability? Okay, um, good question. I'll break this into two parts. One is simply the instrumentation. So ignoring how repeatable burning objects X five times is, can we measure that true heat release rate really well? And I am very lucky to work not only in a lab that, that has these facilities, but in, in a lab where we have a large scale burn facility that's run by really bright people. So within, and then I just get to reap the benefit of that. So within the last year or so, um, Dr. Rodney Bryant looked into exactly that accuracy of our large scale heat release rate measurements and how can we make that better. And there's, there's a study, if you look at accuracy or uncertainty of the 20 megawatt uh, fire hood at NIST, you'll find a report fairly recent on that where they looked at what are the exact measurement signals we need to get right. Our flow rates, our temperature measurements, this, this and that. How accurate can we get it? How do we reduce the uncertainties by, by sampling more carefully? And can we demonstrate this or that accuracy with our heat release rate measurements? So depending on the size of the fire or the hood that we're using, um, and we can span between one and 20 megawatts, I think our facility has as high accuracy in those measurements as you can find globally right now, um, I would be, I don't wanna give a precise number on that, but I wanna say between three and 10% just on getting that fire size correct, uh, knowing that our measurement is right. And it depends on scenarios, but that report would give you the exact numbers for there in different scenarios, but they're doing really good work. And I, and I trust that side of the measurements. As far as repeatability, um, we 
it depends on the on the test, I'd say. Um, if there are a bunch of different paths for development and like this or that can ignite or, or the configuration can change or things can fall over, a test may or may not be as repeatable. I wonder if I can jump back to uh, this slide real quick. I might not get it. It would, so when we ran the parallel panel tests and we were doing repeated tests on different materials, um, we got surprisingly good repeatability. So I wonder if I can share this. Share, share, share. And screen two. So it's fuzzy and uh, that's, it's just gonna have to be fuzzy. But this top figure up here, this is looking at a two meter tall wall fire um, and we're looking, I would say, judge this for, for repeatability. This one fuzzy test on the right, that was the first test that we got. Ignition was, was just not, we didn't understand how we wanted to ignite things. But when we started re repeating these tests over and over, um, they're fairly repeatable, uh, even at the large scale for our parallel panel setups. So as a validation case, those are quite good. And if you go down to all the milligram scale and bench scale testing, that repeatability is even better. So I can hide that thing. No, I don't know how to hide that. So it goes, or you're not even seeing this. Sorry, now you're seeing it. <laughs> um, but again, uh, this is large scale repeatability on the order of like three megawatt fires. And these, this collection of curves represents four or five individual tests that are fairly similar in fire behavior. So um, depending on the scenario that we're testing, we can get really good repeatability when we design our tests carefully and we don't have too many avenues for, for different behaviors. Um, I think um, original test design, we're careful in that to make sure that we know our ignition source is the same each way, our configuration is right. Um, and very, very fortunately, the, the measurements themselves, I'm working with a really strong group. So if they say my heat release rate is three megawatts and I can believe it's three and it's not three and a half. Um, I hope that's fair. I tried to hit on a bunch of different sources of what makes good reliability and repeatability here. Wonderful, thank you, Isaac. Um, we seem to have gone through all the questions um, submitted by our attendees. So do we have any, uh, any additional questions from anyone in the audience? All right, so it looks like there are no um, questions at this time. Um, if those of you that do have any other questions in the future um, or would like to connect on this topic more, um, Isaac's email is on our website. Um, so feel free to look him up and send him an email. I know he'd be happy to answer any additional questions um, you all may have about this topic or anything else in his research purview.